Is there a genre that fits the anthology format better than horror? The stories in horror anthologies are able to hit the ground running and don't have to waste time setting up their worlds. The best horror anthologies are made up of stories that are unique in execution, but that have a common theme amongst them. Stories that are scary, but also have a certain flair for dark comedy. And of course, the most memorable of them feature a great host to connect all the pieces and lead us from one tale to the next. There is one sadly forgotten horror anthology that has all of these elements, not to mention being hosted by the King of Horror himself. Here's looking at you, kid. It's John Carpenter's Body Bags, an almost cult classic. <laughs> In the 80s and 90s, horror anthologies were experiencing a resurgence in popularity. Thanks mostly to Creepshow, the following two decades saw a lot of similar projects emerge. Shows and movies that offered brief windows into strange worlds and tales of horror. One of the most well-known is of course HBO's Tales from the Crypt, which has remained so iconic due to its host, the Crypt Keeper. This little drama is about one of life's unexpected pleasures. Dying, that is. This character allowed the brand to expand to movies, a cartoon series, and even a game show. As the show originally aired on HBO, it had a level of freedom that basic cable didn't really offer at that time. By the early 90s, John Carpenter was struggling to find his place in a rapidly changing industry that was beginning to prioritize the opinion of studio executives over the creative teams. His first film of the decade, Memoirs of an Invisible Man, was one of the biggest flops of the year. There are a lot of surprises in the film, but, but the biggest surprise would be uh... Chevy Chase. It was a big studio movie that he was barely able to assert his style into. I'm gonna bang in that, feel it. Yeah. And open them up, and then you go into the glass, which is what, about that much further? Yeah. Yeah. And we'll sound effect it in. You got it. Carpenter and his team simply like to have fun making movies, and memoirs gave them little room to do that. So the following year, when a Showtime pilot script reached him called Body Bags, it looked to be the type of project that could be fun above anything else. We all know it isn't what a person looks like. It's what's inside that counts. The script is written by Billy Brown and Dan Angel. Though they hadn't written much at that time, these two would go on to write episodes of The X-Files, Goosebumps, and Night Visions, showing that they had a knack for creepy short stories. Carpenter, himself not a fan of anthologies, felt that the proposed series could be a great way to stay active during the period in between his films. It also gave him the opportunity to do something any horror director would love to do, be the host of their own anthology TV show. Oh, better. It's a tradition that was started by Hitchcock and still echoed by filmmakers today. What a bunch of stiffs. Though he had cameoed in a few of his films before, Body Bags gave John the chance to be the face of the project character named The Coroner. A combination of Beetlejuice and Lon Chaney, The Coroner was designed by Rick Baker and required John to undergo a strenuous makeup application. Ah, the doctor will see you now. Ah. Even so, you can tell he's just having an absolute blast in the role. Obviously, these drawers were built before breast implants became so popular. These ought to be recycled. Aside from appearing in the bookend segments, John directed two of the three stories in the movie, and planned to remain on as a producer if the pilot went to series, and he planned to stay on as the host. It seems to me maybe I'm going a little thin on top myself. Ooh. The framing segments in body bags are one of the more clever aspects. Each short is connected via the bodies found in a morgue. See if it's murder or suicide or a nasty accident, they put them in these bags. This one was found in a stretch of lonely highway, miles from the nearest town, on a pitch black night. Now, it's been rumored that the bookend segments were only added in after Showtime passed on the pilot, and material was needed to pad out the runtime. But this isn't true. The host role was there from the start. It was what really attracted John to the project, and like I said, he was willing to reprise the part if it went to series. More natural causes. I hate natural causes. Give me a big old stab wound to poke around in, then I'm happy. John's two shorts appear first and second in the film, with Toby Hooper directing the last one. Now, all three of these stories feel like TV movies, very akin to the style you'd see on Tales from the Crypt. There was obviously a limited budget, but Carpenter still managed to interject more of his style here than he did in Memoirs of an Invisible Man. Even though behind me now is our star. As his classic font returns, and he also composed the score. The casting is also incredible. It's not only filled with amazing character actors from the genre, but also behind-the-scenes talent, such as Wes Craven, Roger Corman, and Greg Nicotero all making appearances. Yeah, I got some bourbon out in the car. Here, I can get you to come out of that booth. 
The first segment, the gas station, is the eeriest of the bunch. Its premise is so simple, yet so effective in being scary. A college student, Anne, is working her first shift overnight at a gas station in Haddonfield, where a killer has recently escaped from an asylum. Through clever writing and filmmaking, the story continually has the audience questioning, along with Anne, whether any of the late-night patrons of the gas station could be the escape killer. You're a little glum tonight, huh? What's wrong? You ought to be out partying, pretty little thing like you, huh? <laughs> I'm not going to spoil the reveal, but this segment is a suspenseful tale filled with some truly creepy moments that really highlight the desolation of being alone in a strange place at night. I haven't seen you around here before. <laughs> My first night. <laughs> The second segment, Hair, is definitely my favorite. In it, Stacy Keach plays Richard, a middle-aged man losing confidence due to his thinning hair. I mean... That looks ridiculous! It won't fool anybody! Be careful with that! The first half of this segment plays like a straight comedy, without any real horror elements. Hi! Stacy sells the anxiety and desperation of his character so well, as he's willing to attempt almost anything to preserve his hair follicles. Have you got some kind of a thickening agent? Something no, I can nothing. put in there to give it a little bit more, you know, volume, huh? But then he meets Dr. Locke, played by David Warner, who offers Richard a miracle hair restoration procedure. It'll change your life, Richard. I want it to change. You sure? I'm positive. I love a positive man. While the procedure initially works wonders for Richard, with him going from self-conscious to smug overnight, he soon finds himself with more hair than he can handle. It's a dark tale about being careful for what you wish for that's sold by a wonderful performance by Stacy Keach. We call this our stallion look. <gasps> Giddy up. Yes, that's it. That's the one. The third story, I, directed by Toby Hooper, is probably the darkest one. It centers around a character named Brent Matthews, played by Mark Hamill, a minor league baseball player with his sights, pun intended, set on the major league. But when he gets into a horrific car accident and loses an eye, his career prospects are cut short. Much like the previous segment, a mysterious doctor then shows up and tells Brent about an experimental new surgery that can replace his eye with that of a dead donor. Unfortunately, I'm pretty much alone in that opinion. Let's say I'm skeptical. After discussing the matter with his wife, played by Twiggy, Brent agrees to undergo the procedure. And again, much like in Hair, the surgery is initially a success. And I want to see you in a few days, okay? Thanks, Doc. But then Brent starts experiencing inexplicable visions of gruesome murder and death. Upon investigating the donor, Brent discovers that his eye came from a recently executed serial killer that starts to take over his mind. Because I got the backyard to work on, okay? You don't have to yell. Do yeah. I? I'm sorry. The highlight of this segment is the truly twisted performance by Mark Hamill. I have to finish digging your grave. <laughs> it really makes me wish he had gotten to play more villains in live action form because he's just so good at it. Please, Brent, go see the doctor. Yes? Will he help? Will he help me? Will the doctor help me? There's a final coroner segment at the end, which features Toby Hooper, where it's revealed that the coroner is actually one of the dead bodies himself. Here, give me that saw. The project aired on Showtime in 1993, and since then it's just kind of been forgotten. It's available on a few streaming services, and Shout Factory put out a great Blu-ray. But even amongst fans of John Carpenter, it just doesn't seem to be that well known. Like I said at the start, the best horror anthologies have a common theme amongst the stories, and Body Bags does a great job at capturing the descent into madness by all of the main characters, one at the hands of an escaped killer, and the others by their desire to change a part of themselves. Why was he so upset about losing his eye? He could have become an umpire. While it's not a perfect movie, a lot of the pacing problems can be forgiven in that it was supposed to be a TV pilot, not a standalone film. But even so, this movie is worth seeking out if you like this type of anthology, or horror movies in general. I wish there had been more body bag stories, because John Carpenter is just so much fun to watch. Nighty night. <laughs>